All right, hello again. Welcome to Apes Chapter 17, lecture video number four. This is the last of this chapter. So let's begin. Let's talk about toxic air pollutants. Well, what are they? Well, they can cause cancers, reproductive defects, neurological, immune, things we've talked about in the, in the past. Um, what do they include? Well, mercury, VOCs, all these gases we're talking about. These are all potentially toxic chemicals that impact us. If you're in a rural area, a farming community, they have major issues with airborne pesticides. They use a lot of them. So if you live in those areas, there's a lot of airborne pesticides in those particular communities. A lot of times they may be outside of an area, outside of a city area, and they're going to get um, drifting pollutants from the city that they're nearby. A lot of pollution is produced in the city, and a lot of it makes its way to these farming communities. Um, animal waste. Oh, man, if you're near... A, a a ranch or an area where you're talking about cattle ranching, methane, a lot of gas is produced. A lot of chemicals are produced as a result of animal waste products from feedlots specifically. And a lot of times out in the middle of nowhere, you're extracting natural gas, rural areas. So there's going to be potential fumes and methane leaks and natural gas leaks from that area. So rural areas, just because they're out in the middle, away from people, away from city, they are not exempt from pollutants in their air. Now, smog, there's two different kinds of smog. There's gray and brown. Gray smog is the smog that's the result of burning coal and soot and sulfur dioxide and sulfur is common in coal. So you burn coal, which is carbon and some sulfur contaminants, you release it in the air and you turn it into soot, that dark grayish stuff and sulfur oxides, all right? These sulfur oxides react with oxygen and water in the air and they turn into acid rain precipitation. So primary pollutants as a result of burning, secondary pollutant that reacts when that is formed after a reaction. Where do you get this gray smog? Hilly areas that are cooler areas. Um, there's been all kinds of regulations pr created over the years to help reduce this, the smog. The industrial revolution in England was a big part of the smog. I mean, if you see old shows and old movies, you'll see there it's just gray. Everybody, everything is dirty because that was the they were burning a lot of coal in those days. All right. So what is it? What's an industrial smog or gray smog? Carbon dioxide. Anything you burn, carbon dioxide. Carbon monoxide because you burned mercury from the coal and the mining and what's inside of these stones. Particular matter, I already talked to that, the little particles that are entering the air. Sulfur dioxide also is in the air, all right? So these are all the components and things that are released in industrial smog. What happened in 1948 in Denora, Pennsylvania? Well, people died that day. People died in that window of time. Well, what happened? Um, basically, it was a small valley, and they had an inversion, which means warm air um, became went over hot cooler air and it ended up trapping a lot of these pollutants at the ground level. So an inversion means you have a flip-flop. You don't have warm air above cold air. You have, you have cold air above warm air in this case, and you start trapping all these pollutants below it. And this is what happened in Denora, Pennsylvania. This is midday, by the way. It's just dark. Um, in London, a killer smog event happened in 1952. Thousands of people died as a result of this same kind of thing london has these wet damp cooler areas and then um, you had inversions take place thermal versions trapped a lot of that a lot of that industrial smog at ground level and it was basically terrible terrible air for people to breathe people were unable to to take in oxygen as a result of that brown smog or photochemical smog why they call it photochemical because the reaction requires photo light so light is part of this reaction. This is the stuff you get in China. Um, this is the stuff we get in LA. LA is known for it. Um, valleys, areas of that sort is where you're going to see it. You, you need hot, sunny areas. Yep. And you need valleys generally. All right. So areas surrounded by mountains are perfect. Like LA is a perfect one. The valleys of LA are loaded with brown air smog. So what happens? Well, nitrogen oxides are released from cars. And when cars burn, it's not just nitrogen oxides. Remember, your fuel is a hydrocarbon, 
and you burn that hydrocarbon and you create volatile organic compounds. Nitrogen oxides form from the nitrogen and oxygen in the air. And these all these different nitrogen oxides form with the VOCs and they enter the air. Now they're hit by sun and there's oxygen in the air also naturally. And then they start turning into secondary pollutants. All right. The secondary pollutants they get turned into, some of them ozone. All right. Some of these some of these nitrogen oxides remain nitrogen oxides that now drift around and become nitrogen dioxide. Okay, so dioxides are here, here. So you see some 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 duplication, but that's okay. The pro the whole problem is this: is these nitrogen oxides, along with ozone, along with solar radiation, along with VOCs and all these other chemicals, they start producing brown smog. Why is it brown? Because of these nitrogen oxides. They have a brownish red color, so brown smog has that color, okay? So they call it photo because light is required to get these chemical reactions to take place, right? And the big problem here is automobiles in LA, a lot of cars. You have these valleys between these mountains. That's cool in the morning. The sun shines, comes over, and boom, perfect environment for brown smog. Ozone, well, what's happening? Well, there's three kinds of ultraviolet light, A, B, and C. Okay, three kinds, A, B, and C. A has the least energy, C has the most energy. It gets progressively worse because of the more energy that UVB and UVC have. So A, B, C, progressively worse as you get to C. So basically when we talk about cataracts or eye disease, that's due to ultraviolet A light. And why are we talking about these? Because, well, the ozone layer protects us from ultraviolet B, primarily, hitting the Earth, all right? A lot of it gets absorbed by the ozone layer. Some makes it through. The small arrow shows you that some makes it through. UVA, a lot of it makes through, makes its way through there. So ozone layer protects us. Well, there's things that are damaging the ozone layer. Ozone is O3. If something reacts with O3 and turns it into O2, we have a problem. We now no longer have as much ozone. UVB is the one that causes skin cancer. Um, UVC is blocked by the atmosphere, not necessarily by ozone, but it's blocked by other parts of the atmosphere. But this is, would be the most damaging one of the three for us. Halo carbons. Well, carbons, all right? And these are hydrocarbons, all right? And then the hydrogens are replaced by halogens. Well, what's a halogen? Well, halogen is on the periodic table. They are in the column next to the noble gases. Those are the halogens. Chlorine, for example, bromine, and those are examples. Those are the halogens. What do they do? Well, they react, these halocarbons, they react with, with ozone and they do damage to ozone. You've probably heard of these from biology. CFCs are chlorofluorocarbons, and fluorine is one of the one of these halogen gases. Okay, so they have chloro, they have chlorines and fluoros. They have two different halogens connected to these carbons. And what do they do? They react with ozone. All right. So what happens? Uh, oh, excuse me, where do they come from? Well, back in the 70s, they used to use these in, in, re in refrigerants and air conditioning units to keep the air cold. They were very stable at, at ground level. They're, they're unreactive at ground level. They're very stable molecules here at the ground level. But when the conditions are just right, they create issues and they damage the ozone layer. All right. Those issues include when it's colder and that happens at higher altitudes, which is where the ozone layer is located. So what do chlorofluorocarbons do? They react, for example, they enter the atmosphere, they go really high in the atmosphere where the stratosphere is, and they enter where the ozone layer is in the stratosphere. And then the chlorine atom in the chlorofluorocarbons reacts with ozone, all right? So radiation rips off a chlorine atom, all right? So sun's involved in this process, rips off a chlorine atom. That chlorine atom then then reacts with O3, and it turns the O3 into O2. So you have less O3 as a result of it. So the chlorine forms chlorine monoxide, and now you have oxygen gas and oxygen atoms instead of having ozone. So it is a ozone-depleting substance. It is one of the biggest problems out there that is damaging the ozone layer. These are the things 
that are damaging the ozone there. It's chlorofluorocarbons. And they're used in aerosols. They're used in making styrofoam. They're used in propellants and old spray paints. In the United States, we have a lot of stringent laws to reduce their use or completely ban it. They're just using different chemicals. In the beginning, they just didn't realize how bad they were for the ozone there. They're very stable molecules, but not stable at high altitudes where it's cold when the sun comes out is generally how they react with the ozone. The ozone hole, well, in the southern, this is Antarctica. So this is 90 degrees south right here. You look at the bottom of the earth. There's an ozone hole. Okay. Hole meaning a thinning area of the ozone layer. So if you were on Antarctica, you're going to, it's a very dangerous place for skin cancer, all right? So what happens? This is a, an interesting situation. Well, in the, in, let's talk about this, okay? Let's talk about why it's in the South too. The Southern Hemisphere, all right, during their winter, they are farther from the sun. They are the opposite of us in the North. In the North, during our winter, we are closer to the sun. During, the win during their winter, the Southern Hemisphere, not where we're at, they are farther from the sun. Because of that, the Southern Hemisphere has a colder winter than we do in the North. That colder temperature is part of the reason why, main reason why that ozone hole is in the South and not on the North Pole, but on the South Pole, all right? So during the dark, frigid Antarctic winter, Temperatures are super cold. This is a th because of these ultra cold temperatures. Remember, they're farther from the sun and they are angled away from the sun in their winter. So they have frigid, colder winters than we have in the north. Be this cold temperatures allow these high altitude stratosphere clouds to form that contain nitric acid. Okay. So I mentioned earlier, nitric acid is, is, a, is one of the ozone depleting substances. It's one of them. All right. What does nitric acid do? That nitric acid, it's a chain reaction. That nitric acid breaks off a chlorine off of the CFC. So nitric acid is indirectly involved in this reaction of depleting the ozone. It creates chlorine atoms high at high altitudes. And remember, it requires super cold temperatures for these high altitude clouds to form. So these high altitude clouds form, nitric acid breaks off chlorine one of those halogens off of the CFC. And then the chlorine reacts with oxygen, excuse me, O3, forming chlorine oxides and forming oxygen gas. And that's how the ozone layer gets basically depleted. So here's what happens. Most of you may, you may not know this, but during their winter, the dead of the winter in the south is dark. There's no sunlight, all right? So you're talking very little sunlight at this part of the world, if any sunlight at all during their winter. You're talking a dark, frozen, cold winter, which is and farther away from the sun. Extremely cold temperatures, colder than we get in the north. That's why those stratospheric clouds will form there. So you have a dark, dark winter, all right? All of a sudden, after winter, spring rolls around, all right? And remember, this is the opposite. Their spring is our fall, so that's September, okay? Opposite seasons on us. So our fall is September. That is their spring. So at the end of our summer is the end of their winter. So at the end of our summer, the end of their winter, the sun starts to rise. And that's in September. The sun starts dissipating all those clouds, spreading those chlorine atoms that were formed because of that nitric acid. It spreads those chlorine atoms everywhere. It starts dissipating the sun. And what do those chlorine atoms do? They start breaking down ozone and they create that hole. So why does it happen at the bottom of the earth and not the top of the earth? It doesn't get cold enough at the top of the earth to have those high stratospheric clouds. So the nitric acid rips off a chlorine atom off of the CFCs and the chlorine atoms do the work. They are the direct damagers of the, of the ozone layer. Okay. So what happens is it disappears. All right. Because of that reaction that starts taking place. All right. And then it reforms every year again. So it goes away and it comes back. It reforms because it's not going to be cold all year long at that point. Eventually they leave winter, they enter spring, they get a hole. Okay. Then the summer months, their summer months roll around and the hole starts to disappear because they're 
it's it's not happening when it's it's not as cold during their summer. Remember, their summer they're even closer to the sun. You don't get those high altitude clouds carrying that nitric acid, so it disappears every summer. Winter rolls around, and by the end of winter, leading into spring, boom, they get their ozone hole, and it shows up almost every year, basically. The Montreal Protocol was 1987. Why is this one important? Bunch of nations got together and said, hey, why don't we use less CFCs? Let's cut it in half at least. And a lot of places have phased it out altogether. Okay, so they're not used like they used to be used. It's basically what's considered a model for preventing global problems. So just one of the protocols that's out there. Acid rain. Well, what? how does acid rain form? Well, you burn coal, you get sulfur dioxide in the air. You burn gas, any other type of burning reaction, like in your car, releases nitrogen oxides. These nitrogen oxides, these sulfur oxides, react with water and oxygen that's in the air, naturally. And you get, so these primary pollutants get turned into secondary pollutants. Sulfuric acid and nitric acid, which are strong acids, which fall to the earth as acid rain. Okay. What does acid rain do? The most, the biggest one for the environment, it, it affects nutrients in the soil. It, it dissolves certain nutrients in the soil and it leaches them. It removes them from the soil. Um, what else does it do? Well, a big one is it can, it can drop the pH of a body of water, um, acid rain. Just so you're aware, we don't usually, it, we don't call it acid rain unless the pH usually falls below five. So acid rain is generally in the fours. Okay pH of 5.6 is about 5.5, 5.6 is normal rain. So normal rain is about a 5.6 on average. I believe 5.5 to 5.6 is normal rain. Why is it acidic naturally? Because carbon dioxide in the air forms carbonic acid in the air. So, as, so rain is naturally going to be acidic. When it drops below that 5 and into the 4s, now you have acid rain. So acid rain, the pH is generally in the fours because normal rain is already acidic. Normal rain is not considered acid rain. Okay, so make sure you understand pH of 5.6, that is not acid rain. That is typical expected rainfall. pH of 4, 4.5, 4.7, 4.8, you have acid rain. Acid precipitation and acid rain, it was addressed um, there's been programs set up. There's the biggest ones have to do with restrictions on emissions, releasing less sulfur and less nitrogen are the biggest ways to address acid rain. If we can reduce nitrogen oxides and sulfur oxides, that's the best way to reduce acid rain. Driving more cars is not helping, you know, dr burning fuel in our cars, burning, uh, fossil fuels to create electricity. These are not helping. Um, these are all the big problems for acid rain or acid precipitation. And this is showing you around the world. This is, excuse me, U.S., sorry, not the world. And this is pH of precipitation in the 90s, precipitation in 2014. And why has it gotten better? It's gotten better because we've created more laws and regulations and are burning less carbon and we're sequestering it. We're using... We're using scrubbers to pull some of the carbon out. Cars are burning a little bit better, more clean. We're starting to shift our thought process. So if you notice, the green is around 5.6, which is what I told you the average, the typical um, rain is around 5.6, 5.7, 5.5 in that range. Indoor air pollution is, is a big problem generally in developing nations, um, third world nations. Why? Because... They don't have as good circulation in their homes. They're cooking in their homes. They're burning items in their homes, and they're inhaling a lot of the matter that's released, a lot of the gases and the particulates that are released. So indoor air pollution is generally a major problem in, in developing or third world nations. Tobacco smoke and radon, these are the, these are the primary indoor pollutants in industrial. So where we live, the big problems are smoke from people, and radon that seeps through the cracks, the radioactive breakdown of rocks in the earth. And that's only seeps into your house if you're, 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 basically your foundation is not sealed. Most foundations today have sealed foundations, so you shouldn't have radon exposure unless you're in an older home. These are the two biggest causers of lung cancer also. Tobacco smoke and radon, real common. 
VOCs, volatile organic compounds, and this is showing you all the places in your house that can re be releasing VOCs in some way, shape, or form. A lot of them in your house. Anything with synthetic materials, fire retardants, um, things that are used in, in chemicals used in the production of your items. There's all this off-gassing takes place. So VOCs are all over the place. You don't want to be inhaling them. They're volatile. That's not good. And they're organic. They can do some damage to tissue. Living organisms. Well, can living things pollute? Yeah. Every now and then you, you'll have a sick building. And what is that? It usually means there's something in the building that is not identifiable, but it's causing people to get, for example, like respiratory illness. Valhalla before the remodel, and it was remodeled several years ago, before the remodel, the big Valhalla building, they be, it was believed that the downstairs area, the basement of the building was sick. P teachers would work down there, and a lot of teachers developed respiratory issues. And what did they think it was attributed to? They believed it was attributed to uh, spores and mold and algae and fungus that was probably down in the basement. The building was not, the, the foundation of that building was not sealed very well. After big rains, uh, the foundation downstairs and that ain't, and that below in the basement, there'd be a lot of moisture in the walls and in the ground, and that moisture sits there, a perfect environment for mold and mildew and those things. So then you are inhaling these spores, and your body reacts to this mold and these things that are airborne. So sick buildings um, generally are, are infected by something. They don't know exactly what it is. It's commonly a lot of times a living pathogen or a living item that's like a fungus in, in a lot of cases. That's the end of our lecture.